This is the review for the final exam, which will be on chapter 11, counting and probability, as well as chapter 12, statistics. Please keep in mind when we get to the probability questions that all probabilities should be expressed as simplified fractions for full credit. Question one, a restaurant offers the following limited lunch menu. So we got for main courses, turkey, spaghetti, meatloaf, shrimp, hamburger. For vegetables, we got peas, squash, cauliflower, eggplant. For beverages, we got coffee, tea, milk, and soda. And for desserts, we got sundaes, mousse, pie, and brownies. If one item is selected from each of the four groups, in how many ways can a meal be ordered? So the first several questions are not probability yet. You're going to see the phrase how many, which means we're going to need to implement a counting formula. Now this first question is the fundamental counting principle, which just simply says we're going to multiply the total number of choices. So for main courses, let's count how many main courses there are. We got turkey, spaghetti, meatloaf, shrimp, hamburger. So that's one, two, three, four, five main courses. And the theme is multiply. So times how many vegetables? We got one, two, three, four different vegetables. Times, what are the total options for beverages? We got one, two, three, four beverage choices as well. Times desserts, we got one, two, three, four as well. So when I multiply the total number of options, if I do five times four times four times four, I get 320 as the final answer. You definitely want to bring a graphing calculator, by the way, for this final exam. Question two, five singers are to perform on a weekend evening at a nightclub. How many different ways are there to schedule their appearances? So if you have all five of them going in order, or in a row, or in a line like that, we could use a factorial as our formula. We're going to take the total number of people, or number of singers in this case, and then we're going to subtract any restrictions, number of restrictions, and that's going to go in parentheses, and then we're going to put a factorial, that exclamation point on the end. So using that formula, there were five singers minus, now when I say restrictions, I mean does the question say a particular singer has to perform first or third or last? No, the question does not mention any restriction in the position of their lineup. So there are zero restrictions. Close the parentheses factorial. So I'm going to do five minus the zero first for five again. Bring over the factorial. We would never ever leave an answer with a factorial, so I'm going to use the calculator and punch in 5 factorial to see what the final answer is going to be. To type in 5 factorial, I would type in the number 5 first, and then to get that factorial, that exclamation point, I hit the math button. It's the third button down on the left side. I go over to PRB using the left arrow key, and under PRB, it's option number four. So I hit the four, then I hit enter on the bottom right for equals, and I see it equals 120 as the final answer. So jotting that down, we got 120 final answer for question two on the review packet. Question three, in a race in which seven horses are entered and there are no ties, in how many ways can the first three finishers place? So we're not going to rearrange all seven horses. We only care about a few of the horses, counting them out and rearranging them, which is three out of the seven. 
So when we're only counting out and, and rearranging a few out of the group, that narrows it down to it's either got to be NPR button, that giant P for, pe for permutation, or it's got to be NCR, the giant C for combination. And now to narrow it down to the correct button to use on the calculator, we ask ourselves, does order matter? Because if order matters, we'll use the permutation button. If order does not matter, we'll use the combination button. So when I say does order matter, I mean would we count it as a totally different arrangement if my little pony one comes in first versus if my little pony comes in third well yes we would count that as a totally different arrangement because it's a competition it's a race so if you take the and any three horses it matters which one of them finishes first which one finishes second which one finishes third, they get different accolades, different trophies, different prizes. So when it's a competition feel like this, it's a pretty safe bet to say that order matters. So it's gonna be the NPR button for permutation. Now that we know which button to use, the rest is just about getting it into the calculator correctly. For the NPR button, we want to list the bigger number first, which was 7. I would write it as a subscript. Then we have a giant P, and then the smaller number last, which was 3. So to 7 horses, we're talking about th with the ways that we could have 3 different first 3 finishers. So now, let's go ahead and just type that into the graphing calculator. To type in 7 permutation 3 into the calculator, I type in the 7 first, so the bigger number first. Then we hit the math button, the third button down on the left side. I go over to PRB with my left arrow key. And for permutations, I'm going to use NPR, which is option 2. Then I type in the smaller number, 3, then I hit enter and we get 210 as the final answer. So writing that down, again we got 210 final answer. Question four, in how many, so it's still counting, distinct ways can the letters of the word robber be arranged? So I do notice that we have repeating letters, we have two B's and two R's. So we need the counting formula that will divide away the duplicate letters, the duplicate items. So if you look up on your formula sheets, look up the duplicate items formula and it has a bunch of factorials in it. And let's go ahead and write out the layout of the word robber first and then we can plug it into that formula. So the word robber has six total letters. From those six total letters, we got two R's. We have one O. We have two B's. And we have one E. The total number of letters or items will go on top of the fraction according to the formula, which in this case was six and it gets a factorial. We're going to divide away whatever repeats, whatever we have two or more of. So I have two R's, so I'm going to write two factorial on the bottom to represent the two R's. I also have two B's, so I'm going to write another two factorial on the bottom of the fraction, the denominator, to represent the two B's. Now it really does not matter if you want to write one factorial to represent the 1O, you can, and a one factorial for the 1E, you can, but it's not necessary. It's only what you have two or more of. So the real question then is how you want to get this into the graphing calculator. If you're going to type this as one line in the graphing calculator, you absolutely need parentheses around the bottom. If you don't put those parentheses there, your answer will be wrong. What concerns me about that is the formula, if you look at the formula sheet, does not show those parentheses. 
So if you're worried that you're going to forget the parentheses, there's another way you can get this fraction into the calculator where you don't need the parentheses. And that was hitting alpha followed by y equals. Let me go ahead and bring up my graph and calculator on the screen and I can show you that latter way where it won't matter if you forget parentheses, if you use the alpha and y equals buttons. To type this into the calculator, because I have a fraction and a whole bunch of factorials going into the bottom, the safest way is to use F1. It might be a different color on your calculator. Mine is hard to see, it's green. And I'm gonna hit alpha and then y equals to activate F1. So alpha, you'll see the A for alpha go inside that black cursor. Y equals, you'll know you've done it right because after you hit alpha, then Y equals. These options will come up. I'm going to choose option one, N fraction bar D. It stands for numerator over denominator. So option one. And then it's very similar to your template you would use in my math lab. I want six factorial on the top. So I use six math PRB option four and then the down arrow key to move that cursor down. Two, math, PRB, factorial, and then another, I don't even have to hit times, I could just mush these factorials together and it knows to mean times. Math, PRB, factorial. Careful here, I need to get my cursor up out from the denominator, up out from the bottom of the fraction, so I hit the right arrow key. Once the cursor is out from the fraction altogether, then I hit enter and I get 180 as the final answer. So writing that down, we got 180 final answer for question four on the review packet. Question five, a four person committee is to be elected from an organization's membership of 11 people. How many different committees are possible? So even though there are 11 total people, we're only counting out and rearranging a few of those 11, a four. So that's my first clue that it narrows that counting formula down to it's either going to be the NPR button or the NCR button. To figure out which button to use for sure, I got to ask myself, does order matter? So if they're all going to be part of a committee, it's not a competition, the order does not matter, which means it's a combination, NCR button. Why does order not matter? Well, who cares if I select Joe first, second, third, or fourth? He's going to be on the same committee regardless of the order I select the names. So the same four people, who cares the order that I select them? They're all going to be part of the same committee. I would not double count the same four people if I selected them in a different order. So they're all just going to be part of a committee or a meeting or a workshop or anything like that. It's NCR button. We're going to type in the bigger number first into the calculator, which is 11. That's a subscript when I'm writing it out using the proper notation here. And then I'll put giant C for combination. We are choosing four people for this committee, so four is also a subscript. And now it's just about putting this in to the graphing calculator. To type this combination into the calculator, I type in the bigger number first, which was 11. I hit the math button after that, the third button down on the left side. I go over to PRB with the left arrow key. Combination is NCR, option three. And we're choosing four. I type in the smaller number last. And then enter for equals. And I get a final answer of 330. So final answer, 330. That zero looks kind of sad there. <laughs> Let me redraw that. 330. There we go. Okay, question six. How many different committees 
can be formed from five professors and 15 students if each committee is made up of two professors and 10 students. So we're only picking out a few of the total professors and a few of the total students. Order does not matter. It's another committee question. So who cares the order? I select the two professors and the 10 students. They're all going to be part of the same committee anyway. So, and I'm going to multiply those NCR buttons together. Keep like with like. So let's start with the professors. We've got to go big to small. So the bigger number associated with the professors is five. And I'll put giant C for combination. We're choosing two of the professors. Let's put profs times. Now the students, the bigger number was 15. And we're going to choose 10 of those 15. Go big to small with the numbers still. And I'm going to do this whole thing as one line into the graphing calculator, multiplying these NCR buttons together. To multiply combinations, I'm going to type it as one line into the graphing calculator. So first I had 5 combination 2. Big to small with the numbers still. This represents the professors. So five math button. Go over to PRB NCR for combination, which is option three. And we're choosing two. I have to hit the times here to multiply the different combinations. Now the students, again, big to small with the numbers. So 15 was the larger number with the students. Again, math button. Go over to PRB. NCR, and then number 10 was the smaller number. Enter for equals. We get a final answer. It's large of 30,030. 30,030 would be the final answer for question six. Next up, question seven. You are dealt one card from a standard 52 card deck. Find the probability of being dealt a club. So if it's been a while since you've worked with playing cards, feel free to look that up on the formula sheet. And the basic setup for most probability questions is what you're looking for, divide by grand total. So think fraction when it says probability. And remember the directions on the front of the review packet, which says, please express probabilities as simplified fractions for full credit. So you can always assume when I ask you for probability, I would rather have a fraction than a decimal. So we're looking for the probability. I'll put P for probability that you select a club. So what we're looking for, we're looking for clubs. So what we want, there are 13 clubs in a standard deck of cards divided by grand total number of cards, which is 52. This would be good for most of the points, but this would not be good enough for full credit. You should always check every single fraction. Does it reduce on this test? And feel free to use this one's an easier one. You could do it in your head. Um, but the harder fractions to come, you want to make sure you're aware of that math button frac enter option. It's a quick way. It'll reduce fractions for you inside the graphing calculator. To reduce any fraction, you're going to type it in first. So in this case, it was 13 divided by 52. And then we're going to hit the math button, option one frac, and then enter a second time. And we see it reduces to one fourth for the final answer. So we do get one fourth. For the final answer, it makes sense because clubs, you could also think of it as one suit out of four total suits in a standard deck of cards. Question eight is one of the harder questions on the test, so I'm going to star it. You might want to go back over it and try it on your own. The reason why question eight is more challenging is because they infuse counting formulas into a probability fraction. Specifically, we're going to use that factorial to figure out the top and bottom of a probability fraction. 
So looking at question eight, we have Larry, Simone, Dawn, Jim, and Katrina have all been invited to a dinner party. They arrive randomly and they, each person arrives at a different time. Find the probability that Larry will arrive first and Katrina last. So you know something very similar will be question eight on the actual test. And because it wants probability, probability at the very least will start as a fraction. So I'm gonna draw my fraction bar. And it still ultimately is what, we, what we're looking for, divide by grand total. So what we're looking for is the number of ways that Larry could arrive first and Katrina last. So number of ways Larry would be first, and I'll just put cat for Katrina last, divide by the grand total goes on the bottom of probability, most probability fractions. In the context of this question, the grand total would be the number of ways, the total number of ways they can arrive in any order without any restrictions. So the specific order would go on the top. Number of ways they can arrive in any order whatsoever. That's the grand total on the bottom. So starting with the numerator, the number of ways that Larry is first and Katrina is last. I'm going to use that formula that we talked about in question number two. So you might want to go back to that um, for a refresher in this video. But we said you take the total number of people in a lineup like this, you minus the number of restrictions, and then you put a factorial exclamation point outside parentheses. So here, parentheses, the total number of people. Let's see, we got Larry, Simone, Don, Jim, and Katrina. So that's five total people. Minus the top here of the fraction has two restrictions. Larry's got to be first, and Katrina's got to be last. So two restrictions, close the parentheses, put the factorial on the top, bring over the fraction bar in the middle. Now let's look at the bottom of this fraction, the number of ways they can arrive in any order without restrictions. So again, there are five total people, Larry, Simone, Don, Jim, and Katrina, minus zero restrictions for the grand total on the bottom, and it gets a factorial. So that's the hardest part, is just figuring out that setup. You know there are going to be factorials involved on the top and bottom. Very, very similar. Again, question eight on the actual final. The hard part is done. I'm going to erase just to create some room here. And let's simplify this for our final answer. Still got two more steps to go. But if I do the five minus two in parentheses first, that's three, bring over the factorial, bring over the fraction bar in the middle. On the bottom, we got five minus zero for obviously five, bring over the factorial. I'm gonna erase again. Okay, so on top, you would type in three factorial into your calculator and you'll get six. Bring over the fraction bar. Now you're going to type in 5 factorial on the calculator. You get 120. After you do the factorials, now reduce the fraction. You can do it in the calculator as well. So if you type in 6 divided by 120, math button frac enter, you will get a final answer of 1 20th. 1 20th final answer. If you look at the answer key I've uploaded in Canvas, I break this question up into three steps. That might help as well, but we pretty much did the same three steps. Either way you look at it, which is use a factorial to get the numerator, use a factorial again to get the bottom, and then combine and reduce that fraction for the final answer for question eight, one over 20. Question nine, you randomly select one card from a 52 card deck 
find the probability of selecting a nine card or a three card. So because of the word or, there is a formula for probability with the word or that we can use. Does not matter if the events are mutually exclusive or not. We can use the same formula where we add and then subtract. So you're going to look up the OR formula on your formula sheet. And it'll say probability of event A first. So the first thing we're happy with is if we get a 9 card. Then we add it to the probability P of the other event B that we're happy with. We're happy with a 3 card. And then we minus the probability that we have both numbers on the same card simultaneously or at the same time. So P for probability. And every single time you see a P for probability, you're going to swap it out with a fraction. Probability means fraction. So I'm going to write fraction bar, bring down the plus symbol, fraction bar, bring down the minus symbol, fraction bar. The bottom of all these fractions, the grand total, is that there are 52 total cards in a standard deck of cards. And now use the phrase above to figure out the tops of all these fractions. So first you want a 9 card. How many 9 cards are there? In a standard deck of cards, where there are four nine cards. Nine of hearts, nine of diamonds, nine of clubs, nine of spades. Don't worry about reducing the fractions, because we're just going to throw it in the calculator at the end and reduce at the very end anyway. So the probability you get a nine card is four out of 52. Now we're looking for three cards. There are also four cards out of 52 that are three cards in a standard deck of cards. Minus both doesn't make any sense. You can't have both. You cannot have both the number 9 and 3 simultaneously on the same card. Meaning these are mutually exclusive events. It's impossible for both numbers on the same card. So that's 0 over 52 or just simply 0. I'm just going to exit out. So really we're doing 4 out of 52 plus 4 over 52, which is 8 over 52. And then when you reduce that, you get 2 thirteenths as the final answer. Now you might want to pause this video because I'm going to have to erase to move the answer up so they have enough room to write for the next question. But 2 thirteenths is the final reduced answer after you reduce the 8 over 52 you get from adding those fractions. We're going to use the OR formula again in the very next question. But again, we got 2 thirteenths, final answer for number 9. Question 10, we're changing it up a little bit. Not cards, we're going back to dice. So a single six-sided die, that's one dice, is rolled. Find the probability, so think fraction of rolling an odd number or a number less than four. So as soon as I see the word or with probability in the same sentence, I'm using that same formula where I got to add and then subtract the overlap. Just looking at the right sides of these formulas on the formula sheet. So for this one, first we're going to find the probability that we roll an odd number. Then I'm going to add it to the probability that you get a number less than 4. Then we always do minus the probability that you get both scenarios simultaneously. Just like with the last question, swap out each p, each probability p with fraction bar. So that fraction let me try drawing a better fraction bar there. We got fraction plus fraction minus fraction. 
The bottom number, the grand total, well, there are six sides, six numbers on standard dice. So I'm putting sixes on the bottom. And then use the phrase above to figure out the number to go on the top. So the first phrase we have is odd numbers. Let's think about all the odd numbers on standard dice. So that would be 1, 3, and 5. So that means there are three total odd numbers, 1, 3, 5, on standard dice. So you have a 3 out of 6 chance at rolling an odd number. Now, let's think about all the numbers less than 4. That would be 1, 2, and 3. So coincidentally, there are also three numbers out of six on standard dice that are less than four. And now, these events are not mutually exclusive. It is possible to roll an odd number that is also, at the same time, less than four. So we need to subtract away the extra count. If you look closely, uh, the one and the three have been double counted here. So the numbers that are both odd numbers that are also smaller than 4 are 1 and 3. So there are two numbers that are both odd numbers and less than 4 on standard dice out of 6. Hard part is done. So at any time you can feel free to throw this in the calculator. Math button frac enter. Even if you do it longhand, you'd have 3 over 6 plus 3 out of 6 is 6 out of 6. Minus 2 out of 6 is 4 out of 6. 4 out of 6 will reduce to 2 thirds. But after you do the computation there, you add and subtract the fractions, you should get 2 thirds as the final reduced answer. Question 11. A single die is rolled. Find the odds in favor of rolling a number greater than 5. So odds is a little bit different. Um, we are going to have probabilities involved in the formula, though. So the first thing you're going to want to do is look up on your formula sheet the odds in favor formula. Look at the right side of that formula. And when you look up odds in favor of something happening, it's going to say it looks like PE on your formula sheet. That means the probability the event does happen and divided by the probability of the opposite, that the event does not happen. So it's going to say not E. So that's what it's going to look like when you look that up on your formula sheet. So putting this formula in the context of this question, when we say PE, the probability the event does happen, that means the probability we do get what they're asking us for, which is that we do roll a number greater than 5. I'm just going to use a greater than sign. It's not a 7, I promise. Just so it's a little less wordy there. So we do get a number greater than 5. Divided by, okay, on the bottom it says P of not E. The event does not happen. So that means we don't get a number greater than 5. We do not roll a number greater than 5, meaning it's going to be either less than or equal to 5. Now, let's go ahead and set these fractions up. So every time you see P for probability, it's going to be fraction that you're going to swap it out with. So for this formula, I have P divided by P. So ultimately what that means is I'm going to take a fraction and I'm going to divide it by another fraction. So let's start with the top fraction. The top says the probability that you do roll a number greater than 5. Well, let's think about all the numbers greater than 5 on standard dice. That would be the number 6. So there's one number that qualifies. One number of what we're looking for that's greater than 5 divided by 6 total sides. On the bottom, now we're looking for the probability of not rolling a number greater than 5. So that would be the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 itself is not greater than 5. So in other words, all the numbers less than or equal to 5. Point is, there are 5 numbers not greater than 5 on standard dice out of 6 
total numbers, six total sides. So I'm going to do 1 6 divided by 5 6 on my calculator. So there are two different ways you could enter this into the calculator. To play it safe, I'm going to use the F1, which is really alpha followed by y equals. So alpha followed by y equals, you'll get this screen right here. Choose option 1, n over d. And that's going to bring that fraction onto your main screen. The top fraction to type in was 1 divided by 6. Use the down arrow to move to the bottom. The bottom fraction you're dividing by in this question was 5 divided by 6. So I used alpha followed by y equals to activate F1 to get that main fraction bar in the middle. Use the right arrow key to get the cursor out from the fraction before you hit enter. And let's convert that to a simplified fraction, which is math button, frac, enter. And we see 1 fifth is the final answer. If you wanted to do it as one line, you would need parentheses around the little fractions. So I could have also put parentheses. 1 divided by 6, close the parentheses, divided by more parentheses, 5 divided by 6, close them, math, frac, enter, and that would also get me that right answer. The choice is yours. There are two different ways you could do it. So we do get 1 fifth as the final answer. You could leave your answer like that. I would accept it for full credit. Technically, keep in mind with odds, you should type in the top of the fraction first, or write it first, and then swap out the fraction bar with a colon, the two dots, and then you would write the bottom of the fraction last. So in real life, I would read this out loud as one to five, are the odds in favor of rolling a number greater than five. But either, either way, one-fifth or one to five, final answer for question 11. Question number 12, you, if you were dealt one card from a standard 52-card deck, find the probability that you are not dealt an ace. So we're back to probability. And for the probability of not getting an ace. When we say not, we mean anything but. So I'm happy with anything but an ace card. You could have two through king, and I'm happy with it. So if we think about it, let's think about how many cards have anything but an A on them, anything but an ace on them. Well, there are 52 total cards in a standard deck, Minus, if we take away the aces, there are four cards that are aces. So that means if we cover up the four aces, 48 cards are anything but an ace. So we're looking for not an ace. There are 48 of those. Divide by grand total number of cards. So I'm going to divide by 52. So I have 48 divided by 52. If you reduce that in your calculator or in your head, you get 12 thirteenths as the final answer. But again, when you see the word not, subtract, take away what you don't want. We don't want aces. So four aces, ace of hearts, ace of diamonds, ace of spades, ace of clubs, and a standard deck of cards. 52 minus the four that are aces means that 48 cards are not aces divided by 52 total cards, which reduced to 12 13ths. Question number 13. If the probability that California will have an earthquake in any single year is 5 out of 22, find the probability that California will have an earthquake in two consecutive years. So thinking about which probability formula to implement, we're talking about two of something. In this case, it's two years. So that means we're going to multiply. So I'm going to write a little time symbol off to the side. So this is the formula. They call it the AND formula, which is really misleading um, in your ebook. So the way I think of it as when you're talking about two or more of something, that's how you know to multiply. 
And we are talking independent events. What do I mean by that? I mean, if California gets an earthquake this year that will not affect it in any way whatsoever, if it will get an earthquake next year. So each year is totally independent of earthquakes happening. So they said in year one or any year, the chances of California getting an earthquake is five out of 22. So again, this represents year one, getting an earthquake. I'll just put EQ for earthquake times. Okay, now here's year two, because it's talking about two years in a row. The chances of California getting an earthquake in year two is still five out of 22. So you're going to do 5 out of 22 times 5 out of 22 in your calculator. I would say just type this as one line, 5 out of 22 times 5 out of 22, math button, frac, enter, and it will reduce the answer for you as well. Let me just move this little 2 down here so it's not misleading. But 5 over 22 times 5 over 22 Math, frac, enter. It's not the nicest answer, but you do get 25 out of 484 as the final reduced answer on the graphing calculator. Question 14. You are dealt two cards in succession from a 52-card deck. Find the probability of getting two queens, so two queens in a row. Well, we're talking about two cards, two of something. So it's going to be the same formula as the last question. It's going to be the formula where we multiply probabilities. But where it differs from the last question is in succession means that these are dependent events. So after you draw each card, it does not go back into the deck. You're never, ever going to draw the same card twice. So when it says like at a time or in succession, dependent events, this is where the denominator of these fractions, that's the grand total number of cards in this case, is going to go down. So just think each fraction represents a card I'm drawing. So we want the first card that we draw to be a queen. And it's each individual probability fraction is still what we're looking for, divide by grand total. So we're looking for queens. There are four queen cards in a standard deck of cards divided by 52 total cards. So the chances that the first card you grab is a queen is 4 out of 52. We always assume we get what we want in probability. So we got one of those four queens. Now our hand goes in to draw the second card. We're already down to 51 total cards. And now we want the second card to also be a queen. Since we got one of the four queens with the first card we drew, we're down to three queen cards remaining. So. 4 out of 52 represents the likelihood the first card we draw is a queen, times 3 over 51 represents the probability the second card is also a queen. So again, we're multiplying two fractions because we're talking about two cards. Each fraction represents the probability of getting a queen card. So each fraction represents a card we're selecting. The bottom number went down from 52 down to 51 because in succession means dependent events. Now you're going to throw this in the calculator, math, frac, enter, and you should get 1 over 221 as the final reduced answer when you multiply these fractions in the graphing calculator. Question number 15, three people are randomly selected one person at a time. So it's just like the last question. These are dependent events again. 
So you'll never select the same person twice from five Republicans, two independents, and four Democrats. Find the probability that the first two people selected are Republican and the third is a Democrat. Because we're selecting three people, that's why yet again, we're going to multiply. So two or more means time to multiply. And since we're selecting three people, guess what? I need three fractions. Each fraction represents a person I'm selecting. So I'm gonna do fraction bar times fraction bar times fraction bar. And we're looking for the first two people to be Republicans. So I'll just put rep for Republicans. And the third to be a Democrat. So I'll just put dem for Democrat. Because it's dependent events, the bottom number of these fractions is going to go down. So let's see, how many total people are there if we add them all up? So there were five Republicans, there are two independents, and there are four Democrats. So if I do five plus two plus four, I see there are 11 total people. So there are going to be 11 total people. I'll get one of those 11 names. Then before I draw the second name, I'll be down to 10 people. I'll draw one of those 10 names. And before I draw the third name, I'll be down to nine people. So I went ahead and I took care of the bottom of the fractions first. And now let's think about the numbers that should go on top of the fractions. So to begin, we want the first person we select to be a Republican. There are five Republicans. So there are five Republicans out of 11 people. You get what you want in probability. So I got one of these five Republicans. Now I want another Republican name, but I'm down to four Republican names out of 10 people. The third person we are looking for is a Democrat. So different category. So we've so far we've selected two Republican names. There are still four Democrat names sitting in the pile, sitting in the pool there, out of, but the total has went down to nine. And if it helps, you can always feel free to draw a picture if you're having trouble seeing where these top numbers are coming from. So remember, at the beginning of this question, if we add up all the categories, there are 11 total people. There were five Republicans. There were two independents, and there were four Democrats. We wanted the first person's name we select to be Republican. There are five Republicans out of 11 total people. We get what we want in probability. So we got one of those five names, and before my hand went in to draw the second name, I'm down to four Republicans and my total is down to 10. So that's where I got the four out of 10 from for the second fraction. Before I drew the third name, again, I got what I wanted. So I got yet another Republican name. So before I draw the third name, I'm down to three Republicans and nine total people. Well, now we want a Democrat name. There are still four Democrat names sitting there, but out of only nine people. So that's where we got the four out of nine from. And then I would just make the calculator do the work from there. I would throw this whole line into the calculator. Math button, frac, enter. So when you do 5 elevenths times 4 tenths times 4 ninths, you get 8 over 99 as the final reduced answer. So the first 15 questions out of 25 total are from chapter 11. Those are the counting and probability questions. The last 10 questions, so that's questions 16 through 25, are going to be from chapter 12 statistics. So we're going to change it up a little bit here. So looking at question 16, the city council of a large city needs to know whether its residents will support the building of three new schools. The council decides to conduct a survey of a sample of the city's residents. 
which one of the following procedures would be most appropriate for obtaining a sample of the city's residents circle the best answer. So it is multiple choice, and there are two things we wanna keep in mind. So first, what should our sample look like? Well, they said our sample should be just city's residents. So I don't care about people that live in the entire state or the country. I'm only looking for answers that target people that live in the city. The other thing to consider is when you're selecting a sample, every single person in the population should have the same fair chance of being selected. So in other words, for this question, every single person that lives in the city should have the same fair chance of being selected. So keeping that in mind, let's look at the possible answers. A says, survey a random sample of teachers who live in the city. Well, A is out. I want every person that lives in the city to have the same fair chance of being selected. So if I only ask teachers, what about all the other people and the other careers? What's their opinion about this? Also, they would have a bias because they're asking if we should use taxpayer money to build new schools. So chances are, if you're only surveying teachers, they're going to say more job opportunities. So sure, that sounds good. So it's too bias. Option A is too bias. And not everybody in the city has the same chance of being selected. So for those reasons, A is out. Taking a look at option B. Survey 100 individuals who are randomly selected from a list of all people living in the state in which the city is located. I was liking the wording until we got to the part that says in the state. So if we only care about the people that live in the city, why are we going to all these other cities and all these people that live in the entire state? So that does not match the population we're studying. We don't care about everybody living in the entire state. We only care about the opinions of those living in the city itself. So B is out. Looking at option C, survey a random sample of persons within each geographic region of the city. This sounds good. It's a random sample. So we're just randomly picking people. And we're going to select from every part of the city which is the population we're targeting. So it looks like C is the correct answer, but let's look through D just to make sure. D says survey every 10th person who enters City Hall on a randomly selected day. Well, not everybody goes to City Hall. You should never ever go to just one location, one building um, for a sample. Not everybody that lives in the city has the same chance of being selected because not everybody that lives in the city goes to City Hall. So D is out, which means the correct answer is C. So C, final answer for question 16. Question 17. A college professor had students keep a diary of their social interactions for a week, excluding family and work situations, the number of social interactions of 10 minutes or longer over the week is shown in the following grouped frequency distribution. Now, why is it grouped? That just simply means there are hyphens. You'll see those little dashes, those hyphens um, on the left side, the left column, the X coordinates there. So we've got a range of numbers going on on the left side. We're going to use this information to answer parts A through C. So starting with part A, it says identify the upper limit for the fourth class. So first let's figure out which one's the fourth class. And remember, classes are on the left side. Those are the X coordinates. So counting down one, two, three, four. The fourth class would be the 15 to 19 class. And upper just simply means the bigger number. So upper limit, what's the bigger number you see in that grouping, in that class? Well, it's going to be 19. So the upper limit of the fourth row down, the fourth class, is 19. 
On the test, I might ask you for the lower limit. The lower limit would be the smaller number. So if this same question had said, what's the lower limit for the fourth class, then I would have put 15 in instead. So be careful there. It could be upper limit or it could be lower limit that I ask you for. And that's just really a vocab question is all that is. All right, on to part B. What is the class with? How many numbers are there in each class, in each group? Well, let's look at the first class, 0 to 4. So if I think about all the numbers there, 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. If I include 0 in the count, there are technically 5 total numbers in that grouping. So the class width is going to be 5. So you could write them out and count them, or the formula we used in class was, you think about the number where the second class begins. So the second class begins at 5, and we subtract the number right above it, which is where the first class begins, 0. So if you think vertical, 5 minus 0 would also give you that 5. But either way you do it, there are 5 total numbers in each grouping, each class, so the class width is 5. And finally, part C, how many students had at least 20 social interactions for the week? Well, here's the 20. I'm going to go all the way down. So I'm going to start with the 20 to 24 social interactions class. So really, once I've identified which rows qualify, then I'm going to add up all their frequencies on the right side. So remember, the number of social interactions is on the left. The frequency itself is on the right. At least 20 would be from here on down. So adding these frequencies together, we got 10 plus, we got 11 next, plus 4, plus 3, plus another 3, plus another 3. When you add up all those frequencies, you get 34 as the final answer. You don't have to show out any work, really, for this question. I'm just trying to explain myself. But feel free to go straight to the answer on any of these parts for full credit. Question number 18. Find the mean for the following group of data items. We've got 125, 65, 95, 65, 85. So the formula for mean is we're going to add up all the data items together and then we're going to divide by the number of data pieces. We're going to divide by the number of items we added, in other words. So here we had 125 plus 65 plus 95 plus 65 plus 85 and then divide it by, let's see, how many scores are we adding? One, two, three, four, five scores. Yes, even though the 65 repeated, I counted it twice, notice. So I'm going to add first. When you add all the top numbers together, you should get 435. Then we'll divide last, so divide by the 5, and we get 87 as the mean average for question 18. Question 19, find the median for the following group of data items. We get 25, 22, 21, 20, 26, 23, 19, 21. Median does mean middle number, but remember, it's easy to forget step one. Before we find the middle number, let's first list the data in order. And I'm going to slash as I go to make sure I get them all. So as I look at all those data items, the smallest number I see is 19. Then I see a 20, then I see a 21, then I see a 22, then I see a 23. Oop, I missed a 21. I got to go back here. So let's erase. 
There we go. I got a 21. And then we had 22, 23. This is why it helps to slash as we go to make sure we don't forget anything. Then we got a 25. And then we have a 26. So let me write this um, a little bit neater. But when you list the data in order from small to big, we had 19, then we had 20, then we had 21 and another 21. Then we had 22, 23, 25, and 26. There we go. Once the data is in order, then you use the memory trick that median means middle number, just like a median is in the middle of the road. So I'm going to slash one number from each side. So 19 knocks out 26, 20 knocks out 25, 21 knocks out 23, and it's a tie. It's a tie between 21 and 22 are in the middle here. Now with median, we're not allowed to have a tie. So to find the middle number, what lands in between 21 and 22, you could think about a number line or you would just do the mean average to break the tie. So I'm gonna do 21 plus 22 and we're dividing by two, because there are two numbers we're adding. 21 plus 22 is 43 to divide by two, and 43 divided by two is 21.5. You can see what I mean by, you just think out logically, what's the number on a number line halfway between 21 and 22? Well, obviously 21.5. Whenever there are an even number of data points, you're going to have this tie, and you'll get, you have to do the tiebreaker round. Now, if there are an odd number of data points, and you do not have a tie, then whatever number you land on is the official median. But here, we had to do the tie, and we see that the tiebreaker round, the mean average, and we see that 21.5 is our actual median. Question 20 says to find the motor modes for the following group of data items. And you see all those decimals there. We got 5.8, 8, 9.2, 6.9, 8.4, .9, another 8.4, 7.4, 8.9, 7.8, 7 6.7, and another 6.7. So mode means what most repeating number was our memory trick for that. Mode, whatever number repeats the most. Most repeating number. And unlike median, we are allowed to have ties for mode. And so I do see a tie here on this review packet question anyway. I see two 8.4s, and I also see two 6.7s. So both of those numbers repeat once, so they are both the mode. So I do need to list them both for full credit. So 8.4 and 6.7 are both the modes for the final answer. If nothing repeats, then there is no mode whatsoever. So again, if nothing repeats, you could have no modes as another option as well. 21, find the range for the group of data items. We've got four, four, five, six, and six. So the formula for range is you take the largest data piece, the largest number, and you just simply subtract the smallest number. In this example, 6 is the largest number, minus 4 is the smallest, 6 minus 4 is obviously 2. So in other words, if you were to graph that data, plot it on a number line, it would spread two tick marks across the number line. So 2, final answer for range. 
Number 22, find the standard deviation for the group of data items. We got three, four, five, six, and seven. You can do it longhand, but it's very, very time consuming, but you're welcome to do it that way if you prefer. Personally, I think it's way quicker to just do it in the graphing calculator. So for this review video, I'm gonna do this whole question on the calculator. Keep in mind on the calculator, when I get to the end, the abbreviation for the type of standard deviation we're gonna find in this course is SX. And I'm gonna round it one digit out. We can think of this as two steps to find standard deviation. The first step is to get the data into the table feature under list one, also known as L1. And remember in this chapter, our favorite button was the stat button. It's right next to the left arrow key. So I'm gonna hit the stat button and I'm gonna select edit number one edit. It's even highlighted and ready to go. So again, to get data information into the table, stat edit number one edit. I'm gonna hit enter on number one edit. Now I wanna get rid of my old information under L1 so I can type in the new information. I'm gonna hit the up arrow key, highlight L1, the highlighter is black. So once that black cursor is on L1, I hit clear followed by enter. And it clears up all that data, the old homework questions data. So now I'm ready to go to type in my new data. So I hit enter after each number. So we had three, enter, four, enter, five, enter, six, enter, seven, enter. Don't forget to hit enter even after the last data piece. If anything repeats, put it in there every time you see it. Step two, now I'm ready to make the calculator figure out the standard deviation for me. So yet again, I hit the stat button, but now I go over to calc for calculate. So that's right arrow key. And just think in this course, we're only ever using option one. So I'm gonna select one there stats. I hit enter on that. Now, depending on what version calculator you have, if you see this screen, just make sure it says list L1, enter. Leave frequency list blank, enter, and then calculate, enter again. So typically I just hit enter all through this screen. And SX, so here's all the information comes up onto the main screen. And now SX is standard deviation. It's about 1.6 if I'm gonna round one digit out because the second digit is an eight, so that five has to go up to a six. So standard deviation is about 1.6 final answer. So 1.6. You'll definitely want to try that on your own graphing calculator at home. If you have any questions, if you get any weird error messages, please let me know. Um, you can check out a calculator, a graphing calculator on test day from the Math Tutoring Center or library if you don't already own one. Question 23 says, not everyone pays the same price for the same model of a car. The figure illustrates a normal distribution for the prices paid for a particular model of a new car. The mean is $19,000, which we can see because it's also located in the exact center of the mound there, the hill of data on the x-axis. And then the standard deviation is 2,000. We're going to use the 68, 95, 99.7 rule to find what percentage of buyers paid between 19,000 and 25,000. It helps that they've labeled the 68, 95, and 99.7 percentages, by the way, for us. So step one, we're going to shade the region that they're talking about. So they said they want between 19,000 and 25,000. So if I locate that on the x-axis, here's the 19. The units are in thousands, keep in mind. So this is technically 19,000. And we're gonna shade all the way to 25,000. I'm gonna shade under the curve always. 
there's step one. Once you've shaded, so you can visualize the region they're talking about, we're going to count how many hops from the middle we've shaded, and we ask ourselves, did we shade in both directions from the middle or just one direction from the middle? So from the middle, I've shaded one, two, three hops, but only one direction, three hops to the right of the middle. Now, let's look at what percentage is linked to three hops from the middle, and that's the 99.7%. However, the problem here is that 99.7% is linked to three hops in both directions from the middle. We want half of that. We only want three hops to the right. So when you want half of one of these percentages, you literally cut it that percentage in half. You divide by two. So if I take the 99.7 and I divide it by two to cut it in half, that gives me 49.85% as the final answer. So again, we wanted the percentage that's linked to three hops from the middle to the right 99.7% was linked to three hops, but in both directions. So to cut it in half, we divided it by two, of course. Question number 24 says, the results of a certain medical test are normally distributed with a mean of 126 and a standard deviation of 15. Use the given table to find the percentage of people with readings that are above 105. Before we can use this chart, we first need a z-score. So we look at the data item, that's the number usually located at the end of the paragraph, which is 105, and our first step is to convert that number to a z-score, to standardize the data so that we can use the chart they gave to us. So I want the z-score for 105. If you look at your formula sheet, the formula for a z-score is you take the data item, which was 105, you subtract the mean, which they gave to us was 126, and you divide it by, I'll use fraction bar for division, the standard deviation, which was 15. Data item minus mean divided by standard deviation. That is a formula on your formula sheet. Now let's go ahead and figure out what decimal that is. So in the numerator, if I do the 105 minus 126, I get negative 21 to divide by 15. On my calculator, if I type in negative 21 divided by 15, I get negative 1.4. So for this particular data set, the z-score associated with 105 is negative 1.4. Now that I have my z-score, I can use the chart or use the table they gave to us. Let's look up what percentage is linked to a z-score of negative 1.4. So right here, the z-score is on the top of each box, the percentiles on the bottom. It looks like it's linked to a percentile of 8.08%. 8.08%. Now here's the part that's easy to forget. Remember, this chart only gives us percentages to the left of these z-scores. If we were to graph this, so we really have to read the wording carefully. If I look near my data item 105, I see it says the word above. Above means I want to know what percentage would land to the right of 105. So if you see words like above or more than, there's an extra step. We just found out in step two that 8.08% of the data would be to the left of 105, but I want the opposite direction. 
So the opposite direction to the right, you take your percentage you got from step two and you subtract it from 100%. So 100% minus that 8.08% .08 from step two gives us a final answer of 91.92%. So 91.92% is the final answer here. Now questions 24 and the next question 25 are very similar. So you just gotta read these questions carefully. What does it say near the data item at the end of the paragraph? Does it say like below, less than, meaning to the left? And then you're done at the end of step two? Or does it say like here, above, more than, meaning to the right? where you have that extra step of subtracting the percentage from 100. Question 25 says, the results of a certain medical test are normally distributed with a mean of 128 and a standard deviation of 15. Use the given table to find the percentage of people with readings that are below 88. So similar to the last question, step one, I need to first convert the score. In this case, it would be the medical readings number to a z-score to standardize that data. And that number is typically located near the end of the paragraph. So that's gonna be the 88. So I want the z-score for 88, and we're going to use the z-score formula again, where we take the data item, which was 88, we subtract the mean, they gave that to us in the original question, it was 128, and then we divide it by, so I used fraction bar for division, the standard deviation, which they also gave us in the original question, they said it was 15. And we do want decimal rather than a fraction here for z-scores. So if I do the 88 minus 128 in the numerator, I get negative 40. And then I'll divide the 15 last. So in my calculator, when I type in negative 40 divided by 15, I get negative 2.6 repeating. And if I round that one digit out to the nearest tenth, that's approximately negative 2.7. So the z-score I'm going to use is negative 2.7. Now step two, we always, once we have the z-score itself, use the chart. So the z-score of negative 2.7 is associated with the 0.35 percentile. So z-score of negative 2.7 is linked to a percentage, very, very small percentage here, of 0.35%. We're not done yet until we check out the word that's near our data item at the end of that paragraph. Why? Because this table is designed to give us percentages to the left of the z-scores if we were to graph it. So if it wants a z-score to the right, we have a little bit more work to do. Here the word was below, below the 88 score. Below means to the left. So our answer is going to be what we had at the end of step two, 0.35%. Because they wanted below, meaning to the left of a z-score of negative 2.7, the final answer, we're done at the end of step two already, is 0.35%. You want to make sure you read this question carefully. If you had seen above 88 or more than 88, remember you have that extra step where you take the percentage and you subtract it from 100.